Hey guys, Nathan here again, Absurd Being, still on Kierkegaard. Um, hopefully this is this is going to be the last of, this is going to be the first of the last two, if that makes sense, of these videos. Um, we'll see how long this is going to go though, I've got three pages, so don't know if I can get this in one. We'll see how we go though. So the, the uh, to the diagram first anyway, so today we're looking at the this section I've called modernity and basically what I mean by that is is Kierkegaard's time Kierkegaard's era and his reactions to and thoughts about the people and institutions of his time and I've broken it down into six um, which will kind of loosely follow society so Kierkegaard's opinions of the people around him um, Christianity what he thinks of of his uh, the, the current for Kierkegaard state of, of Christianity and the church. Um, Descartes and Hegel, so his opinions of those two. In particular, Hegel he has a lot to say about. Um, and science and logic and philosophy. And a lot of this we, we've kind of talked about in bits and pieces here and there throughout this, this series. Um, but in this video, I just want to bring it all together and, um, and make it clear. Kierkegaard's reactions and, and thoughts about his time. So anyway, let's start with society first. So with this one, with Kierkegaard's thoughts about the people around him and, and his age, he has a, in general, he has a very dim view of, of the people of his time. He thinks they, um, they lack seriousness, they lack depth, they, they're not interested in um, the important questions, which for Kierkegaard is uh, questions of, of one's existence, one's standing in relation to the absolute. Um, you know, th these important existential, we would call them now existential questions. Um, people have no interest in them. They're, they're concerned with trivial, superficial affairs. They're, they're directed outward rather than focusing on their their own inwardness, their own subjectivity, so they're concerned with. Uh, they're, they're essentially living in, in the aesthetic sphere, I guess, is what Kierkegaard would say. Concerned with the external, concerned with um, you know, trivial, unimportant things, relative ends, as opposed to the absolute end. Um, and basically, I've just got a, a few examples of... To, to, to support this idea that Kierkegaard doesn't doesn't think very highly of, of the people of his time. Um, so in the, in the postscript, he talks about people having forgotten what it is to exist and having forgotten what inwardness means. Um, and he says, and, and I've got a, a nice quote for this, um, which I'll read in its, in its entirety. The supreme law for people now is variety. For the eternal, however, the opposite holds, and the law is the same and yet changed and still the same. So I quite like this idea. It's come up again and again, and I just want to um, um, draw your attention to it once more. So the supreme law for people is variety. They're interested in change. You know, they're, ne they're never satisfied with, with the one thing. They want always looking for something new. Um, sounds a lot like kind of the consumerist attitude that we that we see around us today, right? Always looking for something new. No one's no one's no one's satisfied with with what they have. There's the idea that if you just get that new thing, if you just do this new thing, that then you'll be happy. Um, so always chasing this elusive goal, which which always seems to be one step ahead of you. Um, so the supreme law is variety for the eternal, however, the opposite holds. The law is the same and yet changed and still the same. So that's the part I wanted to focus on, talking about this idea of change um, and yet remaining the same. We've seen this before. Um, a long time ago, right at the beginning, I think, we were talking about the metaphysical elements of Kierkegaard's philosophy. We talked about... Um, change two types of change 
And Kierkegaard used two Greek words, I think, um, to describe these. The first one was change as transformation. So something undergoes a change and becomes something different. And the second type of change was, the Greek word was a word, the word, a word meaning motion or disturbance. So it's not a it's not a transformation. It's like an alteration. There's it's, it's, there's a motion. There's a, some disturbance to the thing. And this was we saw it wasn't a change in essence, but it turned out to be a change in being. And this was of particular importance when we we're talking about the change from non-being to being, or from possibility to actuality. And that change, you remember, was the change of becoming. And that's the change that, that Kierkegaard's talking about here. The same and yet changed and still the same. Um, and the analogy I gave, which was which was a really good one, and it's Kierkegaard, it's not mine, but the analogy was of a, of a plan. And what changes in the plan when we carry out the plan? So we have this plan on paper, we've got it, um, this idea of what we're going to do, at the moment, though, the plan is still a possibility. It hasn't become real. It becomes real when we actually follow the plan, when we do the plan, when we do what the plan tells us to do. That's when the plan becomes real. So there's a change there, change from, a possi from possible to actual, but the plan itself hasn't changed. We follow the plan through to the, to the letter. So the plan remains the same, its essence remains the same, but something has still changed, and it's that the change from possibility to actuality, or from non-being to being. Um, obviously, if in carrying out the plan, we do something different, then the plan itself has changed. The plan that we carry out is no longer the plan that we um, originally started with. So that would be a, a change of transformation, as opposed to this change as motion or disturbance. So I think that that's an important point which um, I have made before but but I really like it and I think it, it it's worth saying again. Um, so anyway, people have forgotten this. <clears throat> they're all about variety, they're all about the external. Um, in the concept of anxiety he says that people aren't interested in the task of explaining how my religious existence comes into relation with and expresses itself in my outward existence. So that they're not interested in this, this deeper, um, the important question for Kierkegaard, which is this, this one of one's religious existence, one's how one stands um, at that level, at that, in that sphere, and relating that <clears throat> to one's temporal, to one's finite existence. So balancing those two um, the finite and the infinite, the temporal and the eternal in, uh, in, in a human life. People aren't interested in that. And instead of striving to grasp the eternal, in chasing the moment, one learns only how to pester oneself, one's neighbours, and the moment too to death. That's something he says in there. So again, there's this not concerned with the eternal, not concerned with the bigger, most important questions. And in stages, stages on life's way, um, <clears throat> Kierkegaard says that the world just wants to be deceived. So still in line with this idea that they're not interested in finding out the truth, they're not interested in putting in any hard work um, and really coming to understand their existence and, and living their existence, um, living their lives. Uh, authentically, or the, I don't think Kierkegaard uses that word, but but, but we can we can use that here. I think um, they're not interested in that. They just want to just to get through, just do what everybody else is doing, conform to the mediocre. And I've got a quote which I'll read for you. Um, he says, "If one just says something silly and drinks deuce with humanity en masse, then one comes to be like Perdem." loved and esteemed by the whole congregation. Um, so I don't know what deuce is. I guess some kind of, probably, alcohol. And per den 
is, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that, it, it's almost certainly wrong, but um, I think he is a Danish, he's a character in a Danish play. Um, and beyond that, I don't know anything about him, but we get the idea of what Kierkegaard's saying here, just fitting in, just keeping it light, just, just you know, trivial, not serious conversation, nothing nothing of depth, nothing of seriousness to people's lives. And that's all they want. They just want to fit in, do what everybody else does. Um, so he's criticizing that. Um, and in the the sickness unto death, there's, there's one more thing, one more passage where Kierkegaard talks about people being so immersed in triviality and chattering mimicry of the others that they are too spiritless to be in sin or to have a sin consciousness. So there's this idea, immersed in triviality, chattering mimicry, very um, you know, inauthentic, not serious, just completely um, having missed the point, missed the point of existence. And this is interesting, he says they're too spiritless to be in sin, too spiritless to have a sin consciousness. So the idea is there that you, you know you have to have some at least some level of spirit to be in sin. You have to you have to have some depth to you. If it's all just superficiality, you can't even sin. Um, so that that's interesting. It's obviously there's a religious <coughs> dimension to that for Kierkegaard, but I don't think there needs to be. You know that these people are just too. They lack spirit so much so that they can't even sin. That's um, that, that's quite nice. And on this topic of spiritlessness, I just want to talk a little bit more about this. Um, spiritlessness defined for Kierkegaard is where one has a relation to spirit, but that relation is precisely nothing. And the quote for this is, Spiritlessness can say exactly the same as has been said by the most well-endowed spirit, but it does not say it in virtue of spirit. Qualified as spiritless, the human being has become a talking machine, and there is nothing to prevent him from learning to repeat by rote a philosophical rigmarole, a confession of faith, and a political recitative. Um, so there's... With, with, with spirit or without spirit, you can do all of that. You can you can function, and and outwardly you appear exactly the same. The two people, one with spirit and one without spirit, but um, but if you have no spirit, you're just a talking machine. There's there's no nothing behind the words, nothing nothing of of any kind of depth or seriousness there. Um, so there's no anxiety in this position, though, right? So if, if you if you have no spirit, if you're spiritlessness, there's no anxiety because anxiety comes with with a bit of with a bit of seriousness. You have to you have to um, take your take take your situation with a little bit take your situation a little bit seriously in order to feel anxiety. So there is no anxiety here. It's happy and content, but there's just no depth. There's no, there's nothing of substance, and ultimately, it's unfulfilling. Um, and so, again, the idea with spiritlessness that there's a relation to spirit. It's it is the individual is directed towards spirit, but fails. The, the, there's nothing in the relation there. So the spirit is still there for the individual, but. Um, the, the relation kind of never becomes anything. There is still this this connection, loose connection, I guess, if you can think about it like metaphorically in this way, but but the connection never becomes substantial in any way. And the the um, the opposite to this is paganism, which for Kierkegaard is directed away from spirit. So this is an absence of spirit. So this is not spiritlessness. Um, there's just there is there is no trace of spirit that completely on a different on a different track, um, and this is better for Kierkegaard. It's better for one to 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 not um, not have any kind of connection with spirit at all, rather than have this weak 
um, relation with spirit, a relation that is nothing, um, that's then that that's worse for Kierkegaard. You're better off not even having any kind of awareness of spirit. And and I guess Kierkegaard brings in paganism because they had no um, concept of Christianity. There was no importance of of Jesus for them. So there's no um, so in that sense, when Kierkegaard is talking about spirit, he's talking about Christianity and the faith, Christian faith. Um, so yeah, but the, the, the problem is modern Christians have become spiritless. There is still that connection. They still do have that, that, that loose bond, but there's nothing to it. They don't pay any attention to it. They don't focus on it. They don't... Um, they don't have any any kind of serious substantial okay I'm, I'm repeating myself right uh let me leave it there so that's basically Kierkegaard's opinion of people he lived with the people of his time so let's turn to have a look at Christianity now so Kierkegaard's opinion about Christianity is basically the same as his opinion about society in general lack seriousness um and has really become kind of deformed from what it original. I don't know if from what it originally was, but certainly from what it should be for Kierkegaard. Um, so there's yeah, there's no seriousness. It's people treat religion as something very um, light, something easy, something and something that, that they don't even pay attention to you know it's not it's not a focus for them it's a focus on Sundays when they go to church for two hours and then when they leave they don't think about it anymore they don't think about religion until next week until next Sunday you know when they go back to church um, <clears throat> so for Kierkegaard Christianity is central to everything and it should should be forefront in one's life all the time not just on you know when you're in church um, and so that that's all gone. There's, it's, it's too easy now, too. Religion is, people view it as something that, um, it's, all, it's all happy and, and rainbows and puppy dogs tales. It's all light and, and cheerful. But as we know, for Kierkegaard, religion is serious. This is not something you can, you can do easily. It's not, this isn't the easy path. This is the difficult path to take. Um, and that that aspect, that that um, attitude towards religion has just disappeared. So, Christianity is mired in speculation and confusion. He mocks Christianity by calling it Christendom. Um, and in in the postscript, he talks about one big problem being that people think they're already Christians. So I've got a quote for this. When Christianity came into the world, one was not Christian, and the difficulty was to become that. The difficulty of becoming it now is of having, by one's own self-activity, to transform an initial being a Christian into a possibility, in order truly to become a Christian. And he goes on to say that this this um, this becoming becoming a Christian has to also take place within the individual inwardly rather than so there's no outward decisive action there's nothing that manifests externally this is something that one does um, oneself as an individual um, and so it, it's interesting just to look at this in a bit more detail before Christ, when Christianity first came into the world um, <clears throat> one had to become a Christian so there was difficulty because one wasn't a Christian you know you had to you had to become a Christian. You had to learn about Christianity. You had to um, involve yourself actively in order to become a Christian. But now the problem is, as soon as you're born, you're born into a Christian family, or you're born in a country, um, in a Christian country, or you go to a Catholic school. So one thinks that one is already a Christian, just by kind of by default. You didn't have to do anything. You're just born and you become a Christian. Um, and that, that's obviously not the way it is for Kierkegaard. So the difficulty now is we have this 
being a Christian, being a Christian, this initial being a Christian, you're born into a Christian country. But we have to turn that into a possibility, turn it from what we think is an actuality into a possibility, and then undertake the task of becoming a Christian. And that makes it twice as difficult because you already think, people already think they're Christian, when really, for Kierkegaard, they're not. They, 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 are, they may have been baptized, but that doesn't mean they're Christian. You know, They may go to a Catholic school, they may recite the Lord's Prayer, they go to church on Sundays, none of that makes them a Christian. Being a Christian is something inward, it's something internal, it's something... Um, it, it's, it's all of those things we've talked about, your relation to the absolute telos, um, and making sure that you relate to the absolute telos absolutely and relate to your relative ends relatively, and balancing this finite and the infinite, um, manifesting outwardly your the eternal in your outward, in your in your everyday existence. These are the important things for Kika. This is what makes you a Christian. Um, so people don't even have that. <clears throat> they don't even have that awareness that they're not Christian. So the whole the whole process is now doubly difficult. In Stages on Life's Way, he, he talks about modern religion lacking seriousness. And I've got a quote from there. People think of God as a kind elderly uncle who for a sweet word does everything the child wants, just as the child wants it. That is why one is so very fond of this uncle. So the, the, the attitude there towards God, you know, it's very, he's a, he's a friendly, loving, caring doting uncle, does everything you want, you pray for it, he does it. Um, it's this is not this is not religion for Kierkegaard. There's nothing no mention is made of infinite resignation or the absolute relationship of spirit with spirit. There's no depth to this. There's nothing serious. Um, a relationship with God is the absolute, meaning it is bound in both time and eternity. So one should then never speak to God as if talking to another person. Quote, One should never appeal to God for help with a wish, because one thereby binds oneself absolutely. I am obliged to hold to my word. I must at all times firmly maintain that it was and is my only wish, so earnestly, so eternally my only wish, that I dared to give it a religious expression. In other words, if after the passage of some time I come with a new wish, and promptly send for God again, just as fussy parents send for the physician for nothing. What then? Then I have made a fool of God, and also made manifest that I am a comic character who, far from being a hypocrite, assumed that to pray to God was the same as petting Papa on the cheek and saying, Bete Bete. I only read that so I could say Bete Bete at the end. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, you get the idea, right? There's a seriousness here to to um, to one's relationship with God. It's not wish fulfillment. You don't pray to God and, and ask for some. <clears throat> and the reason Gekia gives is because this is the, we're in the realm of the eternal here. So when you wish for something, when you pray for something, you're praying for something for all time. In 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 going to God with this and in, in giving your wish a religious expression, you're raising it. To um, to something which which you want for all time, for all eternity, <clears throat> and obviously most of the times that we pray to God, it's not something we want for all eternity. We're praying for relative ends, relative goals, relative satisfaction. You know, um, satisfaction in 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 our finite lives, as opposed to this 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 infinite dimension to our lives um, so yeah we shouldn't do that but we do people Christians uh, lack they lack seriousness uh, the sickness unto death still on the same topic everything in Christianity should serve to edify it's serious demanding that one be oneself an individual human being this specific individual human being alone before God that's where we're at. That, that's what religion is for Kierkegaard. Um, <clears throat> and in the same same book, he 
he also criticizes the way that people defend Christianity. Because doing so turns it into this pathetic thing that needs defenders. Or that, that, that you can even defend, you know, in with words, with arguments, with proofs, with logic. Um, and the example he gives is, is love. If you were in love, would you try to prove it? Would it matter to you? Could you prove it? Now, you couldn't. And, um, and it's the same for Kierkegaard here with Christianity. You shouldn't defend it because... Why, why, why would you bother? Why would you, why would you need to defend it? Why would you feel like you need to defend it? Um, and finally, in the section, fear and trembling, turning to fear and trembling, he criticizes the way that contemporary Christians distort the meaning of biblical passages to make them more palatable. Um, and an example is hating our family before we can be Jesus' disciples. We, we must hate our family before we can follow Jesus. And the word is hate, God says, not love less or give less priority to or show no respect to. <clears throat> it's hate. And yet contemporary theologians try and gloss over this with, with these other, <coughs> excuse me, less um, uncomfortable, expressions you know so Kierkegaard again he's about taking the this taking his religion seriously not not trying to to gloss over things and, and make it make it all happy and cheerful and, and easy um, interestingly though Kierkegaard resolves this problem of of hating our family by noting that ethically speaking Abraham hates Isaac so this is talking about um, the whole of fear and trembling is about that Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Um, and he says that Ab Abraham ha hates Isaac, ethically speaking. In the ethical realm, he hates Isaac. Um, so is that a kind of, in a way, though, that's also a kind of distortion too, isn't it? I, I think, you know, yeah. Abraham hates Isaac. You have to hate your family in order to follow Jesus. He hates Isaac, but in the ethical realm. So there's there's a there's a as if there's a, a, a deeper level where he doesn't actually hate him. So that seems to be to me to be a bit of a cop out actually. But um, but still, the criticism stands. Um, people try and make make their make make Christianity more palatable. They try and make it easier to. Um, to handle and to to, uh, to defend, and Kierkegaard's not up for that. Should be serious. Um, okay, so let's have a look now at Descartes. I'll, I'll bring Descartes and Hegel together. We'll look at Kierkegaard's views um, on these philosophers. So Descartes and Hegel, <clears throat> and uh, if I could speak a bit more generally here, all philosophers. And the way that, that Kierkegaard's response to, to these two in particular is that they're too abstract. And all philosophy is too abstract. It doesn't, doesn't deal with concrete, existing, individual human lives. Um, and as, as I've, I've talked about ad nauseum in this series, that's what Kierkegaard's all about. An existing individual in, <clears throat> in the world, ex um, living a life. That's the focus, and um, and yeah, philosophy in general, and and these two in particular, he, he um, isolates for criticism um, as being yeah just too abstract. They don't they're, they're not concerned with with what Kierkegaard's concerned with and what he thinks we should all be concerned with actual concrete existence. So let's look at Descartes first. <clears throat> Kierkegaard talks about Descartes' cogito, and he thinks it proves nothing, it doesn't prove anything. So cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, doesn't do anything for Kierkegaard. If the I in the cogito is understood as an individual human being, then it proves nothing because the individual human being already exists. Why do you have to prove that there's an individual existing human being when the I is an individual existing human being. 
you know, it, it's kind of it seems ridiculous for Kierkegaard here. You've got you've already got an individual being. Now you're trying to prove it, but um, yeah, there's no point. There's no point. Um, and if it doesn't refer to an individual existing human being, if it's just um, kind of speculation, then it's all just abstract. It's an all, it's all just an abstract metaphysical um, concept that doesn't mean anything. We're not we're not dealing with any anything concrete, anything real. Um, and again, that's what Kierkegaard's all about. That's what he's focused on. So for him, the Kagito doesn't do any work. Because in order for it to do what it says, um, in order for the conclusion to, to work, you already have to assume that there is, an, there is an existing human being. So he's not that impressed by that. And he also says that doubt cannot overcome itself. Um, and so I think the, the way that Descartes, I think the way he first formulated this, the Cogito, was by talking about doubt. I doubt, therefore I am. So the um, the fact that I can doubt, the fact that there is something doubting, I can't be deceived about that. That was the idea. Um, but, but Kierkegaard says, doubt cannot overcome itself. And the quote, By holding fast for a single moment to the certainty as certainty, I must in that very moment cease to doubt. So we can't get out of doubt um, with more doubt. We can't think our way out of doubt, is the idea. Doubt can only be overcome by ceasing to doubt. And this can never happen in a conclusion. You can't reason your way logically out of doubt. Rather, how do we do it? It's the leap. We have to leap out of doubt. Um, through decision, through a decision. And that's the only way out. It's a qualitative jump made through um, through the leap rather than this kind of progression where again, you know, the idea we can we can cumulatively, gradually acquire knowledge, work equations, work logic and, and get our way out of doubt. That'll never happen for Kierkegaard. That, that's a bridge that can only be What's well, a chasm that can only be crossed with a jump, with a leap. You can't build a bridge over that. Um, so yeah, that's key, that's Descartes. Let's have a look at Hegel. And there's some, there is some really good, there's some really good stuff here. I quite like his criticisms here. Um, so I'll just go through them one by one. The first thing I have is Hegel pronounced I am I. <clears throat> that was um, one of the central ideas of, of Hegel's philosophy. Pure being, I am I. And uh, in, the, in the postscript, Kierkegaard asks, and there's a quote here, is Hegel an existing being or subspecie etern eterni, even when he sleeps, eats, blows his nose, and whatever else a human being does? So that's quite nice. Subspecie attorney is, um, and that, that just means, uh, what does it mean? From the perspective of eternity, I think. But it, it, so it, it's um, taking this universal, very abstract viewpoint on life, um, as opposed to the, to the actual lived, you know, temporal existence that we all that we all share so so um, Kierkegaard asks is Hegel actually an existing being or is he this strange abstract idea that um, so even when he eats sleeps and blows his nose that's quite nice very very um, earthy you know human things related to human existence real existence not this idealized um, abstract concept you know floating up there in the clouds somewhere this is what is what is Hegel is he is he a human being or is he this this concept um, a good question and and 
and important and that, that's why i like existentialism and presumably why you do too because it, it deals with real it gets down to the nitty-gritty of, of real existence what it what it really means to exist not say the scientific um idealized mm, artificial understandings you know they're, they're fine i'm getting ahead of myself with science but but yeah what is Hegel? Is he a human being or this kind of abstract idea? He also says, um, every speculative philosopher mistakes himself for humankind, which makes him something infinitely great and also nothing at all. Same same thing there, right? Um, you know, are you a real individual human being or are you this general concept, humankind? Um, and so talking about <clears throat> moving on to the system, Hegel's system, which, which, which came out of his philosophy, there can, be a logical, there can be a logical system, but no system for life, because life is by definition unfinished. So if you want to have a system, obviously you have to encapsulate everything. You have to have everything um, described, annotated, um, outlined in that system but life by very definition is unfinished so how can you possibly have a system for something that is unfinished and you might say well but we can generalize life talk about it in, in the general and the abstract but that's exactly Kierkegaard's point you can't life is a, a lived life it's an individual's lived experience not this abstract general category so I'll give you a quote. Existence is the spacing that holds things apart. The systematic is the finality that joins them together. When a life is a thing of the past, it is indeed finished. It is indeed finalized. And to that extent falls into the systematic grasp. Quite right. But for whom? Someone himself existing cannot gain the finality outside life that corresponds to the eternity into which the past has entered. So that's just explaining what I tried to explain before far more concisely and far more neatly, right? It's, um, yeah, until existence, in, in existence, things are kept apart. Nothing's, there is not, there isn't this unity of um, <clears throat> completion, a wholeness. That's what existence is. It's, it's, it's um, by definition, incomplete not finalized um okay i don't think there's anything more to say on that um so still on the system Kierkegaard says that with hegel we got a system the absolute system without having an ethics and so this is um, this is another interesting idea ethics properly speaking exists only for a lived life not for whole groups not for the, for example, the human race. Um, so if you want to have an ethics, you have to focus on individuals. Only individuals can can live by, say, an ethical moral code, for example. There is no ethics as it applies to, to large groups of people. <clears throat> um, this is what Hegel talks about with his world history, which is which is arbitrary. Kierkegaard complains. History is never finished. And his system, so his history is never finished, right? You can't, you can't have a system of world history when history is still unfolding. Um, so the whole idea is it doesn't make sense for Kierkegaard. But also, not even that, his history, his system doesn't even include the whole world. He criticizes Hegel for, for just focusing on really Europe, European history. You know, what about Asian history and, and African history? There's, there's more to, um, to the world history than, 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 than Hegel systematized or attempted to systematize. Um, so yeah, world historically, we see cause and effect. Ethically, we see intentions. Ethically, the effect is irrelevant. So when we get to this higher level, this, these abstractions, we can see 
But what we do see is cause and effect. This happened and then that happened. But ethically speaking, what's important are a person's intentions, the intentions behind the act. And so, um, and I've said this before, the effect is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what happens. What, ma what matters is the intention with which one um, undertook the act. So that's a, a swipe at utilitarianism too, right? Um, because you never even know the effect for sure before you act. You can't be sure of your of what's going to happen. So if something bad happens, if, if, it, if it turns out that your act was created more misery than happiness, does that mean it was unethical? You were unethical? What, you know, what, what's important here is you, are your intentions, right? Um, so cause and effect, effects don't, are irrelevant when it comes to ethics. He also criticizes Hegel's idea of mediation, this idea that you have, um, uh, I don't think Hegel actually used the words, but a thesis, antithesis, and you bring them together into a, or you mediate, mediate the two in a synthesis. And then from that synthesis, you get another, it becomes a thesis, and you have a, another antithesis, and you get another synthesis. And so that's how, that's the dialectical progression. <clears throat> uh, but he criticizes this idea of mediation, saying it's all well and good on paper, but this calculation means nothing when it comes to actually existing. It's all just abstract, theoretical, philosophical um, musings on the topic, really. Um, when it comes to actually existing, however, the distinction is not between the finite and the infinite, but between existing finitely and existing infinitely. So that that's just a nice way to, to, to put a um, put put the put something on something to um to, to cap it off quite nicely. It's not about the finite and the infinite, but existing finitely and infinitely. Um, so, that's basically Descartes and Hegel. Let's move on to, I'm going to combine the last two as well, and we'll look at one last section. Um, we'll look at science and philosophy. Okay, so this is going to be quite short. Uh, there's not too much more to add here. Science is, is disinterested. It's the third-person perspective. Um, Christianity is the opposite of this. Should be. Serious involved, engaged, that's where we should be. <clears throat> um, and speculation, philosophy, can't imagine the reality of any particular human being standing before God. It deals only with abstract concepts, for example, the human race, and peels away this idea of before God as well. So there's no, it takes away the religious aspect, which is a problem for Kierkegaard also. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to mention here is knowledge. Kierkegaard talks about two different types of knowledge in, in the postscript. The first is essential, which is concerned with existence. So this is inward, this type of knowledge. It's ethical and ethico-religious. The other type of knowledge is accidental, and this is all other types of knowledge. But these days, when people talk of knowledge, they always mean the accidental. It is thought that it is thought in our age that knowledge settles everything and that one is helped if one only acquires knowledge of the truth, the quicker and shorter, the better. But existing is, some, is something quite other than knowing. So here, Kierkegaard's making a distinction between um, knowledge as kind of how we exist, how we live, knowledge as, as something relevant to our lives as opposed to this abstract philosophical knowledge, which doesn't pertain to, to actual lived lives. And Heidegger does something similar with this. He calls it phenomenological knowing. And this is related to all of those con the practical concepts of, um, of Heidegger's philosophy, the handling of things, using things, and ultimately taking care. That's the fundamental um, that's what everything boils down to there. Phenomenological knowing, which is that practical. And the opposite is an ontic or scientific 
mode of knowing. Um, and this is a deficient mode. This is, this is the mode whereby we stand back from the thing, don't engage with it, we don't use it. It loses any practical dimension and just becomes, you know, a bunch of stuff, a bunch of things that we study. Um, things that are, are separate, divorced from that referential totality, which, Kierkegaard, uh, which Heidegger sees the world as being um, structured by. And he calls that deficient mode lingering with. So we linger with things when we take the scientific um, perspective on them. And so that, that, that really, it's exactly what, what um, Kierkegaard was talking about here, stripped of its religious connotations. Essential knowledge is concerned with existence, with, with what we do, with how we live, and accidental knowledge, everything else, the, the academic, the abstract, <clears throat> and what Kierkegaard would have said, the philosophical way of, of, of thinking. Okay, so that is my um, spiel on this topic. Let's have a quick look at a summary, and then I'll close out. All right, so we saw that we looked first at society. Basically, people are immersed in triviality. They, they have forgotten what it means to be inward. They lack seriousness. Spiritless, they're too spiritless to even be in sin. They, they just, they totally lack any, any, they're still directed towards spirit <clears throat> uh, because, you know, there is, for that, for Kikiyan, it's all, it's all about religion here. So they still, they still have this connection to religion, to spirit, but it's a religion that's precisely nothing. It's, it's empty. It, there's no substance to their, to their, to their relation to spirit. We looked at Christianity and the way that um, one has to become a Christian. One isn't a Christian by default. Christianity, modern Christianity lacks seriousness and this idea of God as, as an uncle, as a friendly, kindly uncle you can ask for favors from. We looked at Descartes as well and the idea that the cogito proves nothing um, <clears throat> and doubt being unable to overcome itself, you have to have a decision, which means that there's a leap involved there. Hegel, there was a lot to talk about with Hegel. Um, he mistakes the individual for human hum, humanity, hum, humankind. There's this. Um, he's 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 not focusing on on an individual lived life. Um, and regarding the system, there can be no system for life. Life is unfinished. You can't have a system with it. Well, with, and with Hegel, what we got was a system, but we didn't get any ethics. Because whatever can go into a system has, can't have an ethical dimension. The ethical is only for an existing individual. Then we looked at science and philosophy. And uh, this was... Kikiyo criticized these as being disinterested and abstract, looking at things from a third-person perspective. And finally, knowledge, which was divided into two, essential knowledge and accidental knowledge. <clears throat> and so that is where I'm going to finish today. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that helped. Hopefully you got something from that. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much. I always feel like I ramble too much sometimes. Always, sometimes, here we go. Anyway, let me just get out of here before I put my foot in it anymore. Um, thanks for listening, and I'll catch you for the next video, which will be the last video for Kierkegaard. See you then.